Um, so this topic, this is not what I do for a living. I'll put that out there first. But this was born out of several conversations I've had with a few teams in the iLab. And kind of Jody encouraged me to, why don't you put it together and put your thoughts into a, some kind of pitch so we can at least kind of talk people through the topic. It's not an overly complex topic, but it's also not an easy topic to have in a discussion with a co-founder. So we're going to spend some time on that today. Um, I think it is a good lunch topic because it is a little bit more conversational, but I'm going to do a little bit of lecturing. I hope you don't mind that. Uh, what I want to do today is present two things. One is kind of an approach for you to have that conversation with your co-founders about kind of relative ownership of the founder pie. Um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time on kind of venture capitalization and dilution. This won't be a venture finance class. You have plenty of opportunities to do that. But I want to make sure you understand the implications of future financing on dividing the founder pie. So first show of hands to make this interact interactive. How many of you are kind of in a startup right now, getting a business going with another founder or more, more than one or more founders, and you're kind of thinking about or struggling with this issue a little bit about kind of relative ownership? Show of hands, just so you get a sense. Okay, maybe a third. And how many are just here for the pizza? <laughs> Come on. The rest of you, I think. Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but and Neil hit on it a little bit. Just a little bit of background uh, on me. I, as Neil mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur many times over. Um, I did a stint on the venture side with Northbridge Venture Partners as well. Graduated from HBS here in 85. Did a stint in consulting in my summer between years, so I got a taste of what I didn't want to do. I realized very early on I was a startup kind of guy. I love this very, very early stage of businesses. That's what I did when I was at Northbridge. I've started three businesses now. Um, one of them is, well, two of them are still go going at this point. Um, one way back when, uh, eRoom Technology was acquired by Documentum and then EMC. That was a great run. I was a very early employee at Lotus Development Corp over here in Cambridge. Currently today I'm doing two things because I'm a little ADD. Um, maybe three things if you add in kind of mentoring work too. Maybe that counts. Um, my primary job is Seed to A, and I'll spend a little bit of time on what Seed to A is. It's an early stage advisory firm that helps kind of early stage companies get to their Series A. Um, and I also founded a company that's a mobile, mobile travel app called Road Ahead, which was really kind of my initiative in learning more about the whole mobile space and all the challenges in building and launching and acquiring customers and monetizing in the mobile space. Uh, great app. Go to the iTunes store and download it, if you will. That's great. Um, C to A um, was born out of the idea that a lot of venture firms are willing to write an early stage check to a great idea and to a young team or a, a, an early team, but then not spend a lot of time with those seed stage investments. And, and a lot of those seed stage companies were kind of blowing up for a number of reasons. Um, but often not because it was the wrong idea or the wrong team. It was blowing up more because they weren't doing the right set of things to kind of get to that next financing. So what we do is work with early stage companies on a whole variety of initiatives. It can be helping on product plan, go to market, customer acquisition, um, uh, monetization. But a lot of what we do is kind of come in and make sure you're thinking about the capital you've raised, how do you deploy it, how do you reduce risk, increase your value, and set yourself up for a Series A well. So we get introduced by the venture firm, often to an early stage company, and then come in and help in that stage between seed and then through Series A. Okay? That's, that's what I do as my day job. Okay? So, um, on to the agenda of the day. Um, I think I may have 20, 30 minutes of prepared remarks, depending on how long I talk. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the pie we're talking about. There's a human side of this, which is the conversation and how you have the conversation with your co-founder. That's probably the most important piece of what's here. I mean, the math is important, but to a great extent, the hard part is the conversation. I'm going to take you through a methodology that I've used with a couple teams now in terms of how to have that conversation in a way that's kind of upfront and out on the table. Um, and I call it my weighted average contribution model to make it sound esoteric and complex, but it's not. Um, and then we'll spend some time on Venture Finance 101. How many folks have taken a Venture Finance class at some level or have some understanding in Venture Investing? Okay, for the rest of you, is this, so I, you'll have to we'll gauge the speed here. Okay, I'm not going to do a deep dive there, but there are a couple things I do want to spend time on. And then we'll do some questions at the end, okay? Um, 
Anybody know the story of the movie, The Producers? What's the basic gist of the story? The basic gist is that uh, by making a Broadway show that flops, they're able to make more money from the insurance that they do with the, the hit show. So they try to make the most offensive show that will close immediately and winds up being a success. That's the basic storyline. But the, finance, the relevance to the finance story is they sold more than 100% of the movie. So they were able to raise more money selling more than 100% of the pie so that if it failed, no big deal. They just got to keep all the proceeds. But if it were successful, now they're in a very difficult situation that they owe more than the 100% that they had. So for the purposes of today, let's assume the pie adds up to 100%. Okay? We're not going to sell more than 100% of the pie. And that's important from the math that we're going to do. Okay. Um, so a few of you mentioned you're having this conversation with your founders right now. Um, and you're trying to have the conversation of kind of who owns what. And the easy path to go down is, well, we started at the same time. We're both kind of same year in school. We're both 50-50 owners. Okay. And sometimes that's the right answer. But I would ask you to go through a little bit more of a methodical exercise, because what can happen if the relative ownership isn't 50-50, there'll be some resentment and there'll be some problems down the road. So you'd rather deal with that now rather than later. And so I'm gonna spend some time talking about the process in which we do that. How do you divide the pie? And then we're gonna talk about what happens once you raise money. So looking at the pie here, you might say, well gee, we could have a conversation that divides the pie up this way. There are three of us. Maybe we can figure out how do we get to these kind of numbers. Let's talk through how we're gonna get there. So first part is the conversation. And I'm going to take us through a model in a second. Um, it's not an easy conversation to have because at some level, it feels a little bit like win-lose. If I get more, you get less. That's not a fun conversation to have with a co-founder or somebody you trust and you're starting to go into business with. It also can sometimes, if it's not handled carefully, can put you in the position of kind of devaluing your co-founder. Well, I do more than you. I did this. You only did this, you didn't do a great job here, therefore my ownership's greater. That's not a great foundation for starting a company, right? Um, they're also adding to the complexity is, you're making a decision today about your relative ownership that has implications about what you're gonna be doing several years from now. One of you may be the CEO, one may be the CTO, one may be the biz dev guy. Um, those relative roles kind of warrant different equity packages and you'll find lots of sources to figure that out. But you don't know what that future is going to be. So that future is a little bit uncertain. Um, I think you all recognize it's a conversation you have to have. Because when it comes time to document it, if you bring in outside money or the lawyers are structuring ownership, you're going to need to be precise about who owns what. Better to have a thoughtful conversation. The role that I've played with some of these conversations is kind of as an unbiased facilitator. Um, it's not a role I necessarily kind of look to do a lot of, but I think it's important you try and find someone who can help in the conversation. That helps kind of mediate the, got, the dialogue with a co-founder or a set of co-founders. Um, probably a, you could try an attorney if you've got an attorney that's worked with you on establishing the company. They may or may not have great skills here. Some of them are, don't have the time for it, but if you have a person that understands early stage companies and can help facilitate that dialogue, maybe reach out to them. Not a good idea, I think, to bring investors into this discussion. I know they're not potentially good at that to overgeneralize. Um, but if you found someone, maybe it's a peer or a mentor or someone else that's done a bunch of startups, been a CEO, can walk you through this exercise and help moderate a discussion. That's a good thing to have, okay? And then there's the model itself. Uh, and the model can be helpful in two ways. One is it's a way that it'll do the math and it'll kind of present, well, here's a, here's a first proposed kind of dividing up the pie. But the process by which you fill out the model, I think, is the most important piece of it. And I'll talk you through that now. So this is the meat of the presentation, if you will. So the model is not overly complex. And I don't mean to make it sound too esoteric, because it really isn't. But what we're going to do here is collaboratively fill out this model as if we were sitting in the room with a facilitator and our set of co-founders, OK? And so what we might do first is say, let's list all the specific contributions that have been made to date or that we anticipate being made. And let's try and brainstorm on what those are. So at one level, there's kind of you know, who had the idea or a combination of who had the idea. Um, what's the technical approach that we're going to use to build it out? You know, so there's someone who brings that to the table. 
perhaps there's a prototype that's been built and there was effort that was put into that, a business plan that was written. Maybe someone took the effort to recruit a bunch of advisors or additional team members. Softer one here is kind of a level of commitment to the project. I've often seen with co-founders, there's the guy whose life depends on it, he's doing it no matter what, and there's the other co-founder that's like, I'm gonna do this, but if we can't raise money, I got plenty of other opportunities, I'm really not here. Different levels of commitment to the project. Uh, perhaps someone was responsible for bringing customers to the table or users of the product already. Maybe there's already some seed capital in. <clears throat> One person more responsible than someone else to make that happen. And then there's the interesting one that's the future uncertain pieces, which is what's the role going forward? Am I responsible, am I CEO, am I next on the line? I'm the one that's taking responsibility for raising the capital? Or am I a technical co-founder and I've got plenty of other opportunities and, and may or may not be as committed? So let's kind of list these out. Any other that I might have missed that you're thinking about on your own projects? Any other contributions you can think of? Okay. Again, you're going to fill out this model yourself. You're not going to use the list of items that I put here. These are just examples. Okay. The next thing that you might do is fill out a relative weighting. How important is that particular contribution? Or how would you value that contribution? The idea might be really exceptional, and that's something you're keeping proprietary. And that, you know, without the idea, there's nothing here. That might get a high weighting. The business plan might capture something that you know, was a bunch of work, but there's nothing spectacular there. Maybe that's a one weighting. Again, these are just numbers that I kind of picked here to give a relative weighting. Um, you know, if someone was responsible for capital coming in and that was difficult to do or that's an important piece, maybe you'd rate that higher. Um, but again, you want to look at this in the broader context of not just this moment in time, but kind of over the duration of the project. Now comes the hard part, and this is where what you want to do with your co-founders is kind of try and divide up what the relative, relative contribution is to each of these elements. So you might fill out totaling to 100% who was responsible for the idea. Was it really a joint idea? Was it one person's idea refined by another? 80-20, 50-50? Was one person exclusively responsible for kind of the architecture and the technology here? And fill these out one by one. Um, this is hard. I would encourage you as you go through this process, um, don't be piggish. Be self-aware. Try not to be critical. Try and find something that feels like a middle ground. This is not an easy conversation to have, but the reason for doing this is you're teasing apart kind of the higher level of I do 50, you do 50, and we can figure out, well, yeah, you were really responsible for this, but that's not as valued from a weighting perspective as that. Does this make sense so far? Folks with me? Anything going on in the back of your mind as I'm walking through this? Does this seem difficult to do? Okay. So this is the methodology I've used. You get through this and you're really focused on individual pieces. It's sometimes easier to have a conversation about, you know, kind of who had the relative contribution on the idea than what's the relative contribution on the whole project, on the whole company. And you can do this one line at a time. And then we do something very simple at this point, which is we do the math. We do the sum of the products and then just divide it by the total to get a relative percent at the end, okay? So weighting times percentage, total it all up by column. Founder one column totals to 655, works its way across the board, and then divide everything by 1400 effectively and you get to the relative percent, okay? So these aren't the answers though. This is kind of what the math computed and what the conversation kind of ended up with. Now it's time to look at your co-founders and say, how does that feel? Does that feel fair? Does that feel unfair? What would you change? Would you go back and iterate? The goal is not to optimize your own respective ownership, though, even though it might innately feel that that's what you want to do. You want to be careful here because you've got to feel good about it. You've got to feel good about working with your founder, your co-founder, and that you all feel it was a fair way to start. This is going to be very important as it goes on down the road and you feel like I was valued for my contributions and what I brought to the table was reasonably represented in the equity in the founder pie. Okay, so it doesn't mean it's 47, 41, 12. It may be, eh, it's adjusted up from there. It feels a little bit more like 50, 35, 15 maybe. Or maybe you come down to it and say, you know, this is close enough. 
it's a third, a third, a third. That's okay. We're okay going in. There's nothing wrong with that answer as long as you kind of go in with your eyes open. Okay, and you had this conversation. Okay. Important part about role going forward. I skipped over that. I didn't mean to. Um, there, there's a, a lot of body of work around uh, kind of relative ownership for different roles in the company. Compensation surveys, um, equity surveys. There are a lot of people who have opinions here on ranges of equity for CEOs, CFOs, CTOs, et cetera. Um, it's worth when you get to the bottom of this kind of comparing kind of relative ownership of the CEO and the CTO and the CFO against salary surveys and say, does that feel fair? Okay. Um, I'll give you a few references at the end of where you can get some of this data. Um, I was going to pull some of it together for you, but then the pitch got way too long, so I just cut it out. But here what I did is I said the CEO relative weighting was about a 50 relative to a CTO at a 30 and a CFO at a 20. My numbers, you can pick your own, okay? Um, it, it really depends on the individual deal, but when you look at typical equity cap tables, post Series A, series a financing, you'll see CEOs in the 10 percentage range, CTOs in the 3 percentage range, and CFOs in the 1 to 2 percentage range. Okay, so it's not too far up. Yes? I was just wondering if you're going to cover this, but if you establish the team, then how do you protect yourself as the founder if somebody leaves midway? Okay, we're going to talk about that in a bit. Yeah, and I want to make, I'll do part of it, but it brings up a broader point. So, good question. Yes? <coughs> Yeah. And would you suggest that everyone sort of figures out what that weighting is or everyone sort of figures out their own weighting and then you take the average of those? Just because I can imagine like people sort of fixing those where they imagine they'll fill out. Um, that's partly why I did the weighting first before we did the, the division of the individual responsibility second, is trying out that conversation and say, really, what's, what's special about our deal? If what's special about our deal is it's a really clever idea, nobody's thought of it yet, well, then there's nothing there without the idea. But often, the idea is a good piece of it, but a lot, there's a lot of other elements to it. We did a great, we have a great technical approach on how to build it that's different from what everybody else has done before. So you can have that conversation. Um, it, hopefully, you can get to something that's kind of, uh, notice I only did three weightings, kind of small, medium, and large. You don't over-engineer this, because I think then you're gonna, you'll never get to the answer. It's, Try and get close so you can have the conversations and you get to the end and then say, how does that feel? Because this isn't a precise exercise. It really isn't, unfortunately. There's no mathematical way to get here. It's about having the right conversation with your, your team. Yes? When you start recording this or drafts of it, yeah. um, do you need to be careful about draft control in case there's a conflict down the line and you know, things are discovered and things that are circulated? <sighs> You know, I tell you, I didn't even, it's a great point. I didn't really think about the legal impl implications here and kind of the recording of this. Uh, my instincts here is you probably want to finish this and throw it away. Okay? Um, I, I don't know if, you'd hate to get to a point that there's a dispute down the road and you didn't do what you said you were going to do and look at what the model said and use this as a legal document. That's not what this is. This is about, you might even just want to have the conversation on a whiteboard and erase it. Okay? It's the conversation that's important, as I said, all right? A ask your attorney, but my gut here is I don't think you want this sitting around as, uh, to be memorialized when the company goes public, I don't think, right? If Zuckerberg had done this, you know, what a mess that would have been, yeah. So if, uh, let me answer that after I go through what happens when you bring in additional capital, because I think you'd treat it the same way. There's, there's in this, we're talking about the piece of the pie that's separate from what the investors own. So as contributed capital, that's off on the side. There's what's owned by investors and what's owned by the team. We're talking about dividing the team piece. Yes, you would also own a piece of the investor piece, okay? You own two pieces of the pie, if you will, is a way to think about that, okay? Okay. So. Let me come back to the investment and dilution piece, and then we'll circle back to the couple other questions that I deferred. How are we doing on time? Okay. Did I turn this thing off? I think I did. It's over-engineered. Okay. So we came back to the founder 
pie pre-money. Now what happens, okay? So now we're gonna raise some capital. Um, there are a number of venture terms you need to know when you go through this process. I'm only gonna focus on really the first two here, three, depending on how you count it. Valuation, vesting, and acceleration, okay? I'll touch on the end about what the other terms are, but they're gonna be important from a monetary perspective, and so you're gonna to wanna to understand them as you're negotiating with a venture firm or an investor, okay? So let's start with pre and post money and valuation. So, oops, wrong way. So of that founder pie, let's imagine that I've convinced an investor to give me a certain amount of money at a pre-money valuation. The value of my company today, before I put any investment in, let's say we agree is $3 million. And I convince an investor to give me $3 million. What's the post-money valuation of my company? $6 million. The pie got bigger, okay? It's very good. Did you go to Harvard? Very good. It's gonna get harder, trust me. Even though it's still simple math, it gets complex. Um, what happened here is I basically increased the size of the pie. So what was three million pre is now six million post. It really is the same entities there. I have $3 million value of the company, plus I have $3 million in the bank, so the company is now worth $6 million, okay? So investors own what percent of the company? 50% of the company. Pretty easy. For their three million, they bought half the company, okay? So what happened to my founder ownership? Okay, oh, we did that already. Um, actually, let me do one two other concept here just so you get it. Imagine if at this $3 million, before I took money in, I had already decided there were a million shares arbitrary number, pick whatever it is, in the company. That means the shares are valued at $3 a share. By bringing in the outside investor, that's an additional million, that's how we grow the pie. So there's now two million shares in the company at $3 a share. That's another way to get to the $6 million, okay? So what happens to the founder piece, okay? So I took in the $3 million, so the pie got bigger, the investors own half, and I own half. So this feels pretty good, right? Let's get to work. Um, but now is when the venture complexities start to kick in a little bit. You're not done at this point. Typically a new investor will want to create an option pool in order to allow you to hire on future employees. Because it's not just the founders that are gonna build this. You're gonna need to get other people on the team and you're gonna need to incent them with equity. And typically an investor would require this as part of the financing, so they would call out we want you to create an option pool of X percent. Typically anywhere, it's actually a fairly broad range. I've seen as low as 10 and as high as 30 points into the option pool. So to make the math simple, let's assume 25%. So now what this looks like, the pie looks a little more different when I say I'm actually gonna put shares aside for an option pool. Yes? Does the option pool always have to come out of the founders? Very good question. Not often, but most of the time it does. Typically an investor will say words along the lines of um, percent of post-financing capitalization. So that when all is said and done, they're gonna, see, they're gonna wanna see 25% of the company post-financing in an option pool. That means it came out of the founder's high, okay? Most of the time it's written that way, okay? So go in with your eyes open. That's what it means. Now, this is not all a bad thing. I mean, you need to hire employees. You wanna motivate employees with equity. It'd be better to put it on the table and say, I have equity put aside for that for employees. And don't deceive yourself into thinking you still own half the company. Because in order to bring on people and build a business, you're going to need to allocate equity to people that come on and join you. Not the same amount as the founders have, but you're going to need to, you know, a, a, you, know, you know, kind of recruit top tier marketing folks, sales folks, engineers. To do so, you're going to need to put equity on the table, okay? So, back to valuation. So I have my pie of 100%. My investor said $3 million plus 25% in the option pool post-financing. So the post-money valuation 
it's still six million dollars, okay? Because the company, nothing changed here. I had a three million dollar value for the company plus three million dollars in investment. So the total is still six. But something actually has changed here. Whoops. Too many buttons. Here's the hard question. What's the effective pre-money valuation? So by doing this, something is a little funny here. Because what happened was I started with $3 million. The post money's $6 million, but I only own a quarter of the company. So something, something happened. The pre really wasn't $3 million by adding an option pool in. The pre-money was lower, $1.5 million. Okay? So the real pre-money valuation on this deal is not $3 million pre. It's a million and a half pre. But this deal will get referred to as a three-on-three. Three. It's typically you will hear words like that tossed around. $3 million invested on a $3 million pre-valuation. Yes? Sorry, I have a question on the option pool again. Yeah. So how long lasted the difference? Is if we have three co-founders and then you, that own 25% of it, mm. you have to set out this 25% for additional employees. Yeah. No, I think, let, let, me, let, me, let me explain how this works. You're reserving a number of shares to hire employees. When you grant those shares to employees, you don't outright grant them. You give them the option to buy stock at that price that they need to earn over time. So if you hire you know, a VP of sales and you say, I'm going to give you 2%, what that means is they're going to have the right to purchase 2% of equity at this stage vesting probably over a three to four year period. So if they only stay a year, they get a third of it or a quarter of it, okay? If they don't vest or if they leave, those shares go back into the cap table. They aren't lost, okay? So you're reserving shares. You're actually not creating those shares, okay? What will happen down the road when there's a liquidity event, an IPO or a sale, it's really only the actual shares that have been granted invested that, that actually granted, vested or unvested, they go into the computation. If they haven't been granted, they go back into the company. And everybody else then benefits from that coming back. You also started with a question, is there variability? There's a lot of variability here. If there's one founder, the option pool is likely to be a lot bigger because you need to hire on some more significant roles. If there's six founders, the founder pool could be bigger and the option pool could be smaller. Okay, so that's going to be negotiated as part of your deal. And the venture guys are going to have a lot of opinions based on your deal of how much they, they want to see in the option pool so that you are reserving enough equity to get talent into your company. Okay? Make sense so far? So going back to the per share math that we did, we had a million shares at $3 a share. What we did by reserving for the option pool is we said we're going to create 2 million new shares for investors and a million new shares for the pool. Thus, now we have 4 million shares at $1.50 a share, okay? So it doesn't look as kind of wonderful as it did before because of the option pool, but it's a more realistic representation of what's going on because you've got to hire people, okay? Any other questions on this? Is people staying with me? Um, yes? The way to think about it is you own the number of shares you own, okay? Don't think about it as a percent. The easier way to think about it is you got X number of shares as part of your founder grant or X number of shares as part of a common option grant, okay? If for one reason or another those shares don't vest or they don't, uh, or, or someone leaves the company and they come back, they effectively just reduce the denominator. So those shares come back into the company. They aren't owned by anybody, okay? So at a time of a IPO, everybody would benefit from that.
I don't know if I've ever seen it done that way. I don't think so. I think it's too complex. Okay. Yeah. So basically, if none of the options were vested, they didn't go to anyone. The founders didn't hire anyone to put in stock, and the company sold. Yep. The founders would split a third, and the investors would split two thirds. Well, effectively, those million shares would disappear. Right, so they would not be owned by anybody. So there'd be two million shares owned by investors and a million shares owned by you. So it's a third, right? Okay. All right. Now, to help with this, this is still pretty simple. It gets a lot more complex because you're going to be bringing in lots of investors, other founders. You're going to be doing successive rounds of financing. I created this model over the past year to kind of represent kind of what happens to your ownership from a dilution perspective, from an entrepreneur's perspective. Being on the venture side, I've done this model a million times from an investor perspective, but I haven't seen a very good model done from an entrepreneur's perspective. So this model is something I created where you can actually put in your successive financings, the shares that you have owned by the, uh, the founders and options, and you can see what happens to dilution over time, okay? And this, if you go to dilution.cda.com, this is a Google spreadsheet. Google spreadsheets are broken, though. I only can share it as read-only. But what you can do is you can save this as an Excel file and then use it, modify it for yourself, okay? All right? If you need help on this, it's, I've tried to make it as simple as I can, but this accurately reflects the math. If you raise angel round, seed round, a series A, a series B, um, there even are some built-in terms for some things we haven't talked about here like an angel discount or a cap on an angel round. Um, this doesn't, this is only trying to reflect effective ownership as if all shares were vested and all shares were what they call fully diluted. So it's not gonna take in the esoteric things where employees leave, okay? It also isn't a good model to kind of decide voting thresholds and, and those types of corporate governance things. There are other models that help do that. Um, but this model will at least help you understand kind of what does relative ownership look like and what does my value look like over time based on my assumptions, okay? This is good to do because you're gonna often have a decision, do I raise more money now at a lower valuation or do I just raise enough to get to my next milestone when I know I can prove more at a higher valuation and raise more money? Here you can kind of play with the numbers and see what the effective implications are on ownership, okay? Um, I'm happy to respond to people if they have questions on this if you get into the model and you're confused by it because I'm trying to make the model better also, okay? So a couple other terms, and we've touched on these a little bit already. Um, vesting, the simple concept of vesting is that your investors are gonna require that you earn your equity over a number of years. Why do they do this? They're not investing in your deal, they're investing in you at this stage because there is no deal without you. So they're gonna wanna know you're gonna stick around, okay? So here's the way they kind of put teeth in making you stick around, or at least encouraging you to stick around. Um, if you leave, you give up your shares. So even though you think, I founded this, I have my shares, the minute you bring in outside capital, they're likely gonna put vesting terms on your founder's shares, okay? Any investor that doesn't is naive, I think, okay? So this is not a bad thing. You know, you're there to build a company and you're asking someone to take a bet on you. Well, the return for that favor is you're gonna stick around and you're gonna do it, okay? I had one of my Series A investors put it most succinctly. He said, finish the job, okay? You're not just, the goal is not raising money. The goal is to raise money, earn a return on that capital, and return capital to your investors. Finish the job. Don't raise the money, have some fun. I'm bored, I'm moving on. That's not gonna be good for your career. Yes? It could be either, but I've typically mostly time because, you know, businesses take a while to build. I mean, we've seen a lot of examples of one-year flips, Instagram-like deals. Those are rare. Those are not the rule. The standard rule is real businesses take five to ten years to build, okay? So even a three to five-year vesting term is not outrageous, okay? You, this also isn't to say you couldn't get additional option grants from the board so you get additional equity as a founder. Treat it as employee, there's other equity that could come your way. That typically would be small compared to your founder ownership, but that could come in the future. That gives you additional incentive to stick around beyond the fully vesting period. Yes? No, I'm sorry. Anybody else? Yeah. So what if you're investing, but then you, you 
receive and get another series of funding before? Uh, no, these shares are, when granted there's a vesting period on those shares, they vest. And that doesn't change with future investing, with future investment, okay? All right. With a future investment, though, you could see a requirement to increase the option pool, though. That typically will happen. So the option pool is going to get, going back to the model here, there's a line here, post money option available. What that effectively does is refresh the option pool. So as a new investor comes in, they're going to want to see the option pool brought up to a certain level. That computation kind of adds additional shares. Does this have a laser on it somewhere? How do I do the laser? Who the hell knows? <laughs> it does a lot of things, except e not easily. Um, shares added to the option pool. Okay, so those get added in over time as new investors come in. Yeah. Uh, I did have a question at the very beginning. You said there's a free market valuation. Is that sort of this whole, a whole assessment pro process of lawyers and all that that was sort of the top part of the trade? You know, that's going to be based on the price that you can agree with your investor. What's fair for what you've done. It's often based on how much have you accomplished, how big is the idea, you know, kind of what's the future hold, how strong is the team. There's a range. It also is affected by the amount of capital you're raising. Because often the, a new investor coming in is thinking more about how much ownership can I get of this company. And so they're backing into a pre-money valuation. You guys need about two million bucks. I want to own about 30%. Boom, that computes a pre-money valuation. That's often the way the investor thinks. But that $3 million stands for what have I created, how big is the opportunity, how strong is the team. And that will vary between one and six in an early, early stage company. Okay? If you're doing a seed stage investment, you may not price that. That may be a note that converts. But I have seen some deals done at 200, 250K where they priced it and that was actually an equity investment. But then, you know, kind of the value of the company is probably sub $500,000 at that point. Okay? Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about the next piece acceleration. Okay? So this was the question earlier what happens if someone leaves, right? Part of it's if a founder leaves, their shares return to the overall pool, not to the founders, but to the overall pool. Um, that protects you a little bit. That protects you from kind of a founder getting a bunch of shares and doing no work and leaving in a month and owning 10% of the company. Um, often there's a lot of negotiation around vesting, though, with founders, okay? And, and a lot of this is kind of based on commitment and based on how long you think it's going to take. There's another piece that happens here, which is something we call acceleration, okay? This is often a term that gets negotiated for founders and for some strategic employees in the beginning, which is what happens in the event of an early acquisition or an IPO, or I get terminated without cause. What happens to my shares? Okay. Um, lawyers are very good at helping you negotiate this. Typically, you'll see some portion of your shares get accelerated. Some portion. Boy, that's a broad term. It could be um, you'll get you know, kind of one year's acceleration. What investors and the public markets hate is a full acceleration or an acceleration that's too large because then what's your incentive to stick around? I mean, we, when you go public or you raise more money or you, even if you sell to an acquirer, they're not just buying the technology. They want you there to help make sure that that technology gets integrated into their company and they may want you to kind of be there for a certain period of time. So they're going to be cautious about how much acceleration is put in there. But there's also a little bit of a reward, and there's also a little bit of a protection factor in here, which is the first guy, people often joke, the first guy out the door on an acquisition is the CFO. There's no job for the CFO. Once the deal's done, he's not going to be a divisional finance guy. He's going to go to another startup. So the CFOs are going to push really hard for acceleration terms because they're going to want to get as much of their equity as they can if an early acquisition happens. Flip side, the CTO is probably the most long-term employee. That's often what the acquirer wants you know, who the acquirer wants to stick around is the CTO. Uh, but all this is negotiated. All this needs to be kind of upfront and defined, okay? Uh, you know, I typically see a year or so's acceleration on these types of events. On termination without cause, probably not that rich, maybe six months at best, okay? 
So that protects you a little bit from a founder leaving or an acquisition happening earlier. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one year cliff would be, um, let's imagine you have a four year vest. Typically that's either done monthly or quarterly, a piece of that, of those shares vest, but nothing vests for the first year. And then one quarter of it vests at the end of the first year. That's your one year cliff. So there's, there's, so there's a little bit of a kind of make sure, make sure you're, make sure that person's sticking around, make sure that there's some value. That typically more happens on employees because you don't know, is the employee going to work? Did the, was the fit there? You know, if someone leaves after nine months, did they earn any of their equity? The one year cliff protects you there, okay? Okay. So I didn't go through all these other terms, but all these other terms have an impact on valuation, have an impact on ownership. Um, liquidation preference, how the proceeds get distributed on a sale. Okay, there's a difference between common and preferred. And also, there are often terms defined around investors getting their capital back before common gets any capital um, and, and how that math is done. Anti-dilution, this gives your investors the protection. Imagine you raise money at three million pre, but the next round's at two million pre. For some reason it was a down round, lots of reasons it could be. Your prior investors might have a right actually to get more shares. That affects dilution dramatically. So there's anti-dilution protection built in. That changes the pie dramatically. Pro rata rights, this is the right of existing investors to participate in future rounds. Uh, that has an impact on pie, but that's a good thing for you, usually. There's a whole bunch of corporate governance issues here around voting thresholds, how issues are decided. These are important things for you to know when you raise money. And then the different rights of common and preferred are going to be important to know. I don't have time to kind of go into all that now. Um, so as follow-up, um, if you want to send me your email, um, I'm happy to send you a copy of the presentation, or we'll probably get it posted somewhere today. Um, there, Noam Wasserman, as you know here, affiliated with Harvard, has a comp study. Um, it, we're in the process of doing the 2012 comp study, but the 2011 data exists. This might be helpful data to you. I don't know if that's accessible to folks in the iLab. If not, we should make sure that it is. But this is helpful data just to see kind of in certain stage companies, in New England, in certain sectors, what is the CTO, what's the range of what a CTO gets, and how does that compare to how we came up with our math on the founder side? And then, as I mentioned, the dilution spreadsheet's available at dilution.cdata.com, okay? All right? So, other questions that we didn't address? Helpful? Yes. Yes? How do you feel about having the conversation with co-founders? Scared. Scared? I didn't mean to scare anybody, but I do want you to be at least kind of methodical about it and thoughtful about it. Okay? Lots more that could be done on venture finance. I don't know if there have been lunch and learns or if there have been seminars in the iLab. There certainly are classes you're gonna take as you go through Harvard and the business school on venture finance, plenty of those, plenty of books too. Um, I could list a litany of them if you wanted them, but I think just getting educated and a little bit smarter about it is good for you as you think about raising capital, okay? Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks everybody.